So do you want to get started? Yeah, let's let's just get started. And um, as, as I was saying, this is so sort of a follow up to the presentation we did a couple days ago um, around how we've built the, uh, the the brocade controller um, and sort of some of the lessons we learned. And these are sort of digging a little bit deeper into what we would sort of love to see um, Open Daylight sort of do around modular, supporting sort of the modularity of Open Daylight a little bit more and, and trying to build some of the existing, um, you know, level one, level two, level three projects against sort of more stable foundations as well as building against the development foundations. So it's probably yeah. the best introduction we have and it's gonna be discussions, um, so please speak up and. Uh, yeah, I, I hope to get off of the stage and wander over to one table where we can sort of huddle and chat soon, but a little bit of diagrams probably helps. So if you weren't here for the talk we gave on um, Wednesday, this is sort of you know the last slides we presented, which is like minimizing risks of updates, um, which is basically um, um, right now if you want to fix something in OpenFlow, um, if you make a changed OpenFlow, um, unless you're willing to release two versions of OpenFlow that have the exact same version, you have to ship the entirety of Open Daylight again, because OpenFlow essentially bakes in all of its downstream dependencies on everything below it. And um, because you know, the way we release things is everything depends on the exact version that you have released. And, there is, and so that really sucks <laughs> because it means that whenever there's a patch you need to fix, not only do you need to ship that patch to somebody, whether it's your customer or you know, held just doing development in a downstream project, you have to take on all of the patches that have happened everywhere up until that point across all of Open Daylight. Um, which means that, like, for instance, rolling back is really painful. If you've ever, I mean, you guys have all, a bunch of you are developers, if you've ever gotten to the point where, like, there's a bug in Yang tools or something that's stopping you from making progress, not that whatever happened, and you try to roll back to, like, a snapshot that's, or, you know, a version that was before that, and then you have to chase all of the versions back through all of its dependencies, it just doesn't work. It's, like, not possible to go back. Um, and so this is, and, and it's just miserably painful. Um, and so what you'd really like to be able to do is you'd really like to be able to sort of just ship OpenFlow and say, well, I'm going to put together a bunch of things which are you know, the previous version of everything but OpenFlow, but then just pull an OpenFlow. And the reason that doesn't work is because OpenFlow doesn't depend, you know, basically nothing lets you swap that version out because all the versions are transitive all the way down. Um, and so this is really our proposed solution. And there's a lot of caveats to this, but like, um, and this should not be stabilized development environment, notice snapshots. This is um, how to fix it. Um, uh, although it's related to notice snapshots, which is basically say when you're developing um, your project, you should develop against both current master and the last release. And not the last release branch, but the last release. So like actually the published released artifacts. So like right now you would be developing against master and lithium. Um, the released lithium artifacts, uh, or maybe even master lithium and helium SR4, which is the last released artifacts for that. And that would involve having a version range in your POM file, um, um, and then having tests that would actually run your compatibility tests against that. And my first, I mean, essentially, Devin says, you really want to test against all of the version, the backwards compatibility you'd like to see. Um, but my, my, my uh, modest proposal, which is not eating babies, um, but is, is more reasonable than that, is just go back one. Which is if we start getting start just start putting version ranges that let us go back one, that will let us take a baby step, but have most of the real complexity of doing it. And um, the cool part if you go back one is it basically only doubles the testing requirements, um, because in theory it might more than double the testing requirements because you would have to test against two to the n where you have n dependencies. But in practice, if you just test against master everything on master and everything in the last release and just of your dependencies then you know, everybody downstream from you will test just their things. And it's not going to be perfect, but my guess is it will get us to a point where we can reasonably move there. And then when we release, you can sort of pick and choose which ones you want to upgrade, at least within that one range band. Um, and I think that would also help a huge number of projects. I know that um, I run into this, which is basically that you would be able to tell when it was a bug in you or a bug in somebody else, because you could test against a released version that's more stable, is not going to be introducing new bugs. So if something stops working, if it still works in the old one, um, it's probably their bug. If it doesn't still work in the old one, it's probably your bug. Um, and right now, we just don't have that. And I think that actually is a huge drag on our development effort. Um, anyway, that, that's, that's the extent of the prepared slides that I think we have. Uh, yeah. Um, so 
And I mean, just to add to this, ideally, to make it, really this is all about making the, the downstream projects easy, lives easier. So if you're working in OpenFlow and you, you know, submit a patch change, or you're just a developer working on OpenFlow, you, you don't want to have to contend with the instability of an upstream snapshot if you don't have to. Um, and so it would be really great if really you could develop against the lithium released artifacts because you know that those are stable. They're never going to change. So you're developing against <laughs> they, the lithium. They might have bugs, but the bugs are static. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you can develop against that. And then it would almost be better to develop against the lithium artifacts and then when you push it upstream into Garrett, it automatically goes out and tests against both the master and the lithium. Yeah. And that way, you're developing in a stable world, and then you test against the development world to sort of ensure forwards compatibility as well. And only, only if you need a new piece of functionality from that master stream would you ever sort of want to switch your development world to the master. But even then, I, I would think you'd want to actually you know, you'd want to wait for that master to stabilize and release before you start depending on it as your sort of only way to develop and get that functionality, if, if you can. I mean, generally, you want to wait for the things to release before you start building against them. And again, the same analogy we use is, you know, generally speaking, you know, take the uh, Java libraries, right? We, we didn't compile against 1.8 beta or 1.8 alpha. We waited until 1.8 was released, and then we started compiling against it. Um, unless you're obviously trying to incorporate it into your environment and get out the door with 1.8 right, the, you know, right when they release it. But the reality is, for the most part, people aren't going to move that yeah. fast. The, the development won't move that fast. And you can generally wait for the next release to come out and then just bump yourself up to that next stable release. Yeah. But I think that would have been untenable early on in Open Daylight. Um, because there was so little functionality and we're basically putting the plane together as we took off. Um, and so there was no way to decouple this. But now, I mean, the truth of the matter is, I think the number of projects that are in lithium depended on features that came out in their dependencies in lithium is not huge. I mean, we sort of have some really reasonable stability in our APIs, and that's looking like it's going to increase over time. I mean, one of the requirements in the Brilliant release plan is if you're a stable feature, you need to be backward compatible with you know, with your APIs. And I think this would also help, I mean, the fact that we'd be doing this testing would just help us understand when we're making incompatible changes, too. Because, right, if somebody changes something, like, I mean, right now, how do you know if a change is compatible or incompatible? Uh, you know, we really aren't testing that in a reasonable way. Um, and this would, and, and, and this sort of forces you to, because it means I'm compiling the same code simultaneously against two things. It also checks whether or not the bug fixes are being patched back into the last stable version, um, uh, because, you have to deal with that as you move to the last release. So I think this has a lot of advantages. I think it has a little bit of complexity. One of them is that you have to switch to using version ranges in your POM files. When you use version ranges in your POM files, I don't know how you force it to use the right version um, when you're testing, but, but I trust that smarter people than I have figured that out in Carafe and in POM files and Maven and all that stuff. I don't know. Does this, does this make sense to people? Does it sound crazy? Do we have a mic? Yeah, so I mean, this is sort of, this isn't something that one or two people can change in, in the community. It's something where really the projects need to make the decision, do you, do you want to kind of make, develop, make your developers' lives easier and be a little bit more? No, we want to make our developers' lives harder. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, I mean, it's something that the community will sort of need to decide to do, but. Yeah, so this is just me. Um... One, Colin handed me the mic, so I'll ask something. Um, and, and also some clarity, that a place I'm not super clear on. Uh, how does this relate to a potential future world where we are doing continuous release and our, our minor version is getting bumped every night and our new release thing is every night? Um, so I think this is a baby step towards that. I mean, like, so, so, so if you're going to bump, bump your um, um, build release every single, you know, like a couple times a day, every time you built. Um, so for those of you, there, there's, I mean, semantic versioning, there's four numbers. There's major.minor.micro.build. Um, and I, I meant to say micro, by the way. Oh, uh, you meant to say micro? OK. Um, and that would be like every week or something like that. So if you do micro every week, I mean, so, so my, if you asked me, 
I would say that you would express your range. So when you replace a dependency in a POM file, you can either express a particular version or you can express a range, and the range can be inclusive or exclusive on either end. And so you can say, like, I want to depend on, like, you know, 4.1 inclusive to 4.2 exclusive. Um, and if you're not a math major, that's this kind of thing on this end and this kind of thing on that end. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it basically means that if you, what, it, it, you know, no matter what it is, if it's less than this, you'll use it. If it's equal to that, you'll, you won't. So you basically say, when I, when I bump my, my um, to 4.2, which would be bumping my minor version, I would, I, would, I, I would fail when you tried to load me because I don't have my dependencies met. That's pretty straightforward. So it, it's able to be supported pretty well by the versioning scheme we have. Yeah, yeah, and so basically, so in, 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 you have to do that in order to make this work, which is you have to say, like, my dependencies are, you know, whatever lithium version is to, or to you know, beryllium inclusive or exclusive. Not all of our projects are doing full semantic versioning yet. Is that um, correct? That is absolutely true. Right now, the only, right now, no projects are doing full semantic versioning. The only versioning that happens in Open Daylight right now is that when we release, Tan runs a script, which if it was a major release, bumps master by a, by a, by a major. And on the stable branch, if we did a, if we did a, a stable early release, we bump it at minor. So basically, right now, if you think of um, hydrogen was 1.0, um, there was no hydrogen SR anything, so there was no 1.x, there was only 1.0. Um, helium was 2.0, and helium SR1 was 2.1, helium SR3, SR2 was 2.2, and, and beryllium is 3. And that actually is true of the versioning for the distribution. Like, those are the actual versions we're shipping of the distribution. Oh, fair enough. Okay, is it? Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, so uh, another thing is, um, I think some of our tutorials actually tell projects to create 1.0 as their, when they create the initial project. And then the script, when it runs into that situation, it turns it into a three-digit version. And then there's at least one project using four-digit version. So I, th I think it'd be less confusing if we got all projects to agree on, let's use like three <laughs> digits. So, so that, that, I agree. It's, it's sort of orthogonal to this. Um, I mean, so, so, but I mean, I, I think as long as you agree on sort of what happens when we bump, as, as long as everybody agrees, when we do a major release, this happens. When we do a minor release, this happens. Um, and, um, and we should probably move that one to the left, and we can do that pretty easily by changing our scripts. Um, then then their version, your, your range dependencies work, right? You should say that if I want to depend against, you know, helium, or sorry, lithium SR1 to whenever we release boron, I can say, and, then I, and I claim to be compatible with that, I can basically say, and, and it, you know, I'm compatible on, you know, whatever it is, um, 3.1 to, or 2, you know, 5 exclusive, which is say, I will work with any release after, you know, lithium SR1 to any, to up to, but not including boron. Um, and so that's, and now the hard part about that, just expressing that dependency is trivial, right? Like, that, that's just a matter of, I mean, it's annoying, you have to go through and change all your POM files, but that's not that hard. We have to change some scripts to understand that there are range dependencies. We have to change, there's a whole bunch of tooling around range dependencies that we have to build, but it's not that complicated. The hard part is testing, um, and that's what I don't understand. Um, I mean, I understand it in the, conceptually, which is that, you know, if everybody tests against every sort of release that they're theoretically compatible against and master when they build, you'll know if anything breaks. What I don't know is how to actually make that happen from a, from a Maven standpoint, which is how do you force a range dependency to get collapsed into a particular point for testing? So, so before we go on down to that, I just wanted to come back to your comment about the, the continuous integration and, and bumping that, that micro version or the build number. Um, I have sort of two thoughts on that. I'd, I'd say, in general, you want to at least be building against the last official release ga version of the product. Um, because your, your continuous integration is only as good as your tests that you have to validate it. Um, so if, if we're bumping the versions every night, but we don't have a test that validates um, you know, that this, this little change down in the lower, you know, layer zero project doesn't break an upstream project, well, then you're still breaking upstream devs and you're still making devs' lives harder. So, so we have a, a, you know, a micro, a build number and it's somewhat officially released. Maybe we're not calling it a snapshot, but really it's still a snapshot. Um, so I, I would say, I mean, when I, when I look at this, what makes our lives easier and what, what makes sort of 
you know, anybody's lives that's depending like, it, on, on the OpenFlow plugin, for example, is you're building against the last sort of G8 version of the product. Um, and that way, you're, you're basically saying, if for some reason something went wrong and the beryllium layer zero core projects were delayed by three months, six months, you know, maybe it was a year, you're not delaying the release of that OpenFlow plugin to get in the clustering enhancements that we want, to get in some of the other functionality there. So that's, that's sort of the, the desire is always build against the latest G8 version for, for step zero. Always build against the latest G8 version and the, then really it's if you want against the master branch. Um, that'll just help to detect incompatibilities. But I, I would almost say the more important thing is building against the latest G8 version of the product um, as your sort of your goal. And so you may be delayed three months, six months from taking advantage of the new stuff, but you're also not blocked by that, that unstable development branch. So to repeat the question, what if you oh. need APIs from the unstable, from the, from the development branch? Um, that, that's where you do one of two things. You either say, well, we are now tied to that, that development branch, so we need to bump ourselves and we're gonna take all the risks that come with it. Or two, you try and get that development branch to accelerate a release of a stable version that adds those APIs. Why are we saying uh, because because you're, there's two different goals here. One of them is that you want to be able to get the most recent APIs, and the other one is you want your your you want to be building on a foundation that is not fluid. Um, and the answer is at API freeze, um, your foundation is still fluid. It's just the API, like like you know, you laid a skeleton, but like it it, it will still hurt you. <laughs> yeah. So so there. So I, I think I get it now. So you're saying. Switched, switch from building against the GA version to the, the development branch once the API freeze happens. And so, like, like Colin was saying, the, you know, oftentimes I've, I've seen literally just API stubs get put in right before the freeze date, but the interface is there, but the implementation isn't. Um, so, and then you're working on the implementation for the next two or three months, fixing bugs, implementing it, changing the way it works, and that always has the risk of causing, of causing instabilities and, and breaking things. And um, you know, in, until you have like, you know, let's, let's say the time to test was zero, the ideal thing would be if you put a core and a, a, a patch into a layer zero project, you would test everything above that to make sure you didn't break anything before you actually allowed that patch to go in. Um, I'm pretty sure right now we only test the functionality within the project. So if you put a, a fix into Yang tools, you're only testing that you don't break Yang tools and maybe you go one step above the controller. No, okay, so you're only testing that you don't break Yang tools. You don't test that you don't break the controller or the open flow or something else. And then when you start rolling these patches up, I mean, I think we've all experienced that where something goes down and you have to wait sort of eight hours or something for the fixes to roll up before you can start building again. And that's, that's where you just building against the stable G8 version of the product is safer um, in the long run. So you're basically asking for us to be able to not just verify that the patch was builds cleanly and does the unit tests, but also to essentially gate that, that patch from being able to be merged in upon not breaking the world. Uh, that, well, that, 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 that's ideal. That, that's sort of the holy grail. I mean, we, we, we've, had, we've had that conversation <laughs> and, and I use the word gate on purpose because that's what there's, you're asking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, there's yeah. gate. I mean, so, so, so we've, we've had this conversation in the past um, and, and the argument has always, and, and all right, so, so I'm gonna put on my Ed hat, which is um, uh, um, that's ridiculous. If I fix a patch, fix a bug in controller and that exposes a bug in open flow, I should not be punished for that. I should be able to merge it. Um, uh, and I'm gonna put my Colin hat back on and say, that's ridiculous. You should be able to test your downstream people and figure it out. You owe them that, they're depending on you. But, that, but anyway, the result of that argument is that we haven't done that, um, in addition to the fact that you know, it would massively increase our testing requirements. Although that being said, we're pretty close to running every single test on every single patch anyway. 
but it, it, it doesn't inform back into but, Garrett. But, but, there's but, no way we can do that the way we're currently doing it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, so, and so I think that's orthogonal, which is there's an orthogonal thing, which is, hey, wouldn't it be great if we knew when a patch was going to break people downstream? And that might make, um, um, that might make reduce the risk of developing against master. It's not going to eliminate it because we don't test everything. Um, and, right, and, and the truth of the matter is that like, even with a, okay, so let me tell, so internally at Brocade, we started developing against master. And, and that shot us in the foot immediately. Um, and then we started developing against the latest master that passed all tests unified. Um, so we actually depend on our own Nexus, and we only publish Nexus artifacts as a snapshot if the entire project end to end built with that patch in it. So the result is we were only introducing a new version of master when it, the whole thing worked. And that was happening, interestingly, only about once or twice a day. Um, <laughs> uh, um, at, at the time, and this was a while ago, so it's a little better now. And even then, we kept on getting bit by things because we don't have the test coverage in order to make that meaningful um, enough in order to actually limit you. And especially if you're developing and you're trying to poke, I mean, when you're building something, you're almost certainly building against corners of open daylight that were never done before. Like the probability, and, and as a consequence, you, you, that's, it will help, it's not gonna fix the problem. And so what actually, and, and so when you hit a bug, Really, the question you always have is, is it me or is it them? And if you're doing development against master, even with this, you're still going to have that question. And answering it is a pain in the ass. If you develop against the last GA, and if it's me or is it them becomes trivial, because it, 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 it's, you know, because they didn't change anything. It's you. Um, you know, if the behavior regresses. If you're doing something new and it doesn't work, you don't know whether it's not working because of you or them, but there's nothing to fix that. But at least, you know, you're not finding new bugs that aren't in you because they didn't change. Yeah, and, and before you ask a question, Ryan, or add your comment, I'll just add the, the, ideal, the, the idea of, of gating on every single patch only works if, A, you have 100% test coverage of all functionality that you care about, and B, and, and not just unit test, unit test coverage, integration test coverage, you know, you wanna 100% make sure everything that you care about works. Um, we're not there, right? I mean, it, it's almost impossible to get that. The other piece of it is um, you, you need to make sure, so, so there's 100% uh, coverage, and then when you add in a piece of functionality, the test can't lag behind. So when you add a piece of functionality, that, that addition has to include the tests. And if it doesn't, well, then there's no, you, you lose the benefit of any gating methodology. So it's, there, there's really this sort of nirvana of, Yes, a true, if you want to say 100% true CI world, everything's 100% test coverage, everything you care about is covered. You don't put a change in, if, or when you propose a change, every test is run everywhere, and you gate if anything blocks because you've changed something that either, you know, somebody was depending on the bug, you know, this, the Ed Collin discussion. Um, I'd say for the nature of this conversation, let's just um, agree that that is nirvana, and we're not going to get there in the next release or even the next couple of releases. And, and let's probably, you know, so if, if we don't have that 100% stuff, we need, you know, you're back to sort of this idea of you want to be building against a sort of stable version of the product, which that will never change, which is really GA. I mean, that, that's really the only thing that we can say will never change. And then, you know, you could do monthly releases or weekly releases that add more stability. But you're still, I mean, you're you're still putting yourself at risk of saying, is it is it me or is it them? And so by having a, a GA version, you know, if you build against the GA versions, then you do a patch that says, I'm bumping my support now to build against the next GA version of the product. You know that the only thing you change in that patch is the versions of the downstream dependencies. So therefore, if something breaks, you know that there is an API change or an implementation change. It either exposed a bug in your code or it's a bug in the upstream, but that's where you then can make the, you, you can have the conversation about did you break something in your implementation that now you need to do another patch for or something. So um, I'd, I'd say we probably should steer away from this nirvana of continuous true integration and all this and, and focus more on the idea of so, do we want to build against the GA version of the product and potentially only against a GA version of a product. I mean, I think that's going to be up to the projects to ultimately decide, but 
Um, so. that, that has the advantage that it's something we already build and ship and have, as opposed to continuous release, which is a, involves a whole other moving part that is yeah. actually producing those released artifacts. Um, right. So it has uh, the advantage that it's doable now. I feel as though this could potentially slow us down a lot and kind of destroys the cross-project synergy that a lot of our groups have. Um, that's why I was asking, you know, why don't we do it against the API freeze date? We have different offsets at different times, kind of for this reason. Even if they're going to put a stub method there, I can localize my changes by mocking or something like that, something more elegant. And, you know, if they don't end up following through on their contract, then it's an API change, there's going to be a waiver, it's going to be pretty obvious that I need to make changes. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, again, that's an idea of adding, um, or, you know, you're going down to a finer level of granularity, which reduces the risk of uh, breakage. And, I mean, that, you know, you, you have a good point of there is some synergy within the projects, and, um, you know, if, if you were to wait, like, if you were to take all the projects and say, you know, you got Yang tools at the core, and then you have MD Sal. So MD Sal is six months behind Yang tools, and then you're six months behind MD Sal. Now all of a sudden, you know, you're a year, a year and a half, or two years out from getting a bug fix if there's something in, in Yang tools. So um, I, I think you're you're right there. You know, one way to fix that is you start speeding up your releases of the downstream projects. Instead of it being six months, be more targeted, be more focused, and have it be every three months. I mean, I know. I'm going to point at Jamie over there because he's sitting over there. Um, Caraf, they do service releases every six to eight weeks. It's a, just a, a routine. So, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's one way to solve that problem. But, I mean, maybe the baby step is when that API date comes, we do some type of, of version change internally, and, and that's when you bump all the project, the, the higher level projects up or something. Oh, sorry. I, yeah, my concern is that, like, you know, this coming release, as they're improving uh, clustering APIs and such, am I going to have to wait until the next release to utilize those? I mean, this is something we needed yesterday. It slows down the development process significantly. Yeah, so this is the building, building the plane as you're taking off, you know, making sure you have that wing in place um, as you start to take off the ground. And, and you know, that's, that's where the projects will need to make the decision of, well, I really depend on this this new feature that's coming in, I can't wait the the six weeks for it to get in there, so I'm going to start using it right away. Um, I I think in that scenario, your idea of of bumping up or changing your development branch at the the freeze date is probably the next best solution because at that point, you know, your APIs aren't going to change. You know, you can start to take advantage of the stuff, but you know, so. So I have a different take, which is that you are the uncommon case, and as are most of the people in this room, um, and that most projects are not using most new features in each release. So OpenFlow plugin is going to use the new clustering features, and everybody's going to use OpenFlow plugin, but, in, but the OpenFlow plugin API ought to stay the same whether clustering works or not. And so everybody above OpenFlow plugin is actually going to be insulated from that. They can use the, the lithium normal one with no clustering support, and they won't have clustering support, but you know what? They'll still work in the, with the old OpenFlow plugin. And everybody that's downstream of them could work with the new one, and they will get clustering support for that. Um, and my guess is the API changes to OpenFlow. I mean, OpenFlow plugin shouldn't change its contract to its applications based on clustering. If it does, that's a bigger problem, and I think that's actually probably something we should watch. But most projects, would, most of the time, are not, in my, at least in my experience in this release, are not picking up new features from their downstream things. Um, and when they do, I absolutely agree that, you know, right, when you have to, you have to. I mean, you're not compatible with the old version of, open, of, of Yang tools anymore, or, the, or controller anymore, because you need their new API. Like you're saying, you know, and that, and that happens, right, in projects all over the place, which is that you have some big feature shift that happens, and, you know, you, backward compatibility doesn't work, and there's a significant shift. Python 3 is a really great example of something where, like, you know, it sucked. <laughs> you couldn't get from 2.x to 3. Um, and so that happens. But, but I think that's less common than... So if you're a core developer of Daylight, it seems like that's, that's everything, but I think that's not true. I think that, and this is sort of one of the experiences I've had writing being TSC chair, is that there's a huge swath of project out there that does not behave the way the core developers of Daylight see it. 
And, and Andy, I think, also sees this, which is you want to optimize to make the tail's life easier. And because when the tail's life gets harder, it puts huge amounts of strain on the core of open daylight. And one of the things that we've done really successfully over the last year is to cause it so that way the tail projects don't cost us anything. <laughs> they cost Andy like 15 minutes to set up, right? Maybe it's 45 minutes to set up the project. Uh, and, and they cost us, you know, basically reading an email once a month or something like that for the most part. But like, it used to be that, you know, literally it would be weeks of work every single release in order to incorporate these sort of tail projects. And I think that that's sort of where a lot of this is targeted. The other place this is targeted is for projects which are will, I mean, are, you would like to at least have the option to not suffer, right? Like, if I'm willing to jump through the hoop of not depending on new features, I could not suffer. Um, and forcing everybody to suffer because a few people want to suffer sucks. Um, so let's try and avoid doing that. That's sort of my take. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'd say it is ultimately up to the projects, and it's it's really just about a matter of making your lives easier. And and for the most part, too, even if you oh the OpenFlow plugin again needs the new clustering API, well the OpenFlow plugin. You, I mean, you mentioned mocking up the the interfaces. I don't know what other enhancements they want to do in the OpenFlow plugin, but you know it, it, that would be a, another sort of prime case where do some of the other work first against the, the GA version. Once those internal APIs start to stabilize a little bit more and you actually have some implementations where you can start doing something, then go ahead and, and shift over. I think in general, the APIs are probably relatively volatile until that freeze date. Um, and, and being able to effectively mock something in a, in a quickly will, will, is, I, I guess it, it may work out great or you know, things may change a lot and you spend all your time mocking and you haven't achieved anything. So you're, I think you're still gonna always have an advantage. If you need a brand new API, you're always gonna have an advantage building against stable until there's something there for you to start taking and using. Um, and, and then it's the decision of the project of when you switch over to start using that new stuff, you, you switch over and, and you just accept the risks that come with it. So, uh, I mean, I, this is, again, just a lot of theory and... <laughs> yeah, so, so the next step is somebody needs to actually go try to make some of this work. Um, and that's, you know, going to involve, you know, getting a whole bunch of projects just with using ranges in their versions. Although good news is that versions aren't... Every, we've done a reasonable job of collecting version numbers out of individual POM files and into a couple of important POM files, although we'll have to fix some of that. Um, and then it involves actually figuring out how to do the testing where it is that you can force it to load multiple versions. And my guess is that that's something where I'm going to go to Jamie and Jamie's going to say, here's how you do it. Or Devin. Um, and, and, no, and, and Jamie. If I'm understanding correctly, generally the way I'd be looking at that is in PAX exam, you're going to be loading your distribution and you're going to have a set of tests. One's going to be uh, throw in the this particular plugin from SR4, throw in, run your test. Next iteration, run in from Lithium, run that plugin, run the same set of tests. You'll do that three times over. So I'm just looking at it as being a regular package SAM type ex uh, testing situation. Uh, doing that in a large scale, you're just going to be having a variable for what set of three you're going to be testing against. That being said, I would want to kind of like proof of concept that just to make sure it would work with your distribution. <laughs> that's yeah, that's yeah. where I'm where I look yeah, yeah. out on side from here. Yeah. I mean, I, I, so, so I think this is just a matter of, I mean, I think the, 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 the primitives are there. It's just a matter of throwing them together and seeing where, where they fail and then fixing it. But we've had a history of success with Craft and Maven in that response. But a history, we have a history of one, testing things that should work, two, discovering they don't work, and three, discovering how to make them work um, um, in a bunch of different areas. But I, I think that's possible. I mean, the, I, mean for, I think, but I could be wrong, I think if you just have integration have a POM file which has the dependencies for, ex explicitly has a dependency on every single bundle for its SR4 version or its you know, li or lithium version, that that will cause, it, that will cause OSGI to load that, like, that concrete version and, and, and collapse all the ranges down to that. That being said, I, I don't know and I want to test it. Yeah, I mean, in the end, you want Carafe to load the lithium, like the lithium artifacts for the, for the downstream dependencies and your artifacts for the upstream dependencies. Um, it, this would probably actually be best pocked 
in a tail project. Yeah, yeah. Because your tail project most likely are not depending on any new crazy features coming out of core. And you know, I, I would actually encourage the sort of offset two, offset three project, even the offset one projects potentially, to, to try and say, well, do I really need something new coming in lithium? Or, or do I, you know, can I, or sorry, coming in beryllium? Or, or can I just sort of continue to evolve my project against lithium and, and maybe look at some of these ways that I can ensure I'm backwards compatible with lithium and beryllium? And um, again, the, the tail projects are probably the best ones to do that because A, you want the stability and you probably don't need the new functionality per se coming out of core. I mean, there's always exceptions, but... Um, and then you could start to play with some of these things of at a minimum, you know, the, the first way to just do this right out of the gate, you change your dependencies in your project to not yeah. be, you know, snapshot master. You change them to be yeah. released lithium. That, that's the easiest way to do it. Now, that means you're not building against master anymore, but yeah. so, so what? I mean, is that a, is that a big problem? I, 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 I don't know. Probably not. As long as by the time the beryllium release com starts to come to a head, and then then you say, okay, now I'll make that jump and and you know we've done a few service releases against lithium. We feel good about it. Now we're going to jump against master and, yeah. and deal with that. I mean, the, the only disadvantage of that is that offset two projects are. Um, we have this weird thing, which is offset two projects are the lowest risk place to do things, but they're also the lowest activity places, um, by and large. Um, like which is to say, getting people to actually do things there is complicated. Um, all throughout TTPs is something that would go play with this. I mean, that's sort of. I don't know. I, I mean, it's not a toy project, but but it's something which I sort of do in my spare time and would be willing to try a bunch of this stuff out with. I don't know if there are other projects that would like to play with this. But I think I think anyway, I think this would help develop. I I actually I I think this will. De I agree. This will slow down. Well, well, it will give no value when you really need to have tightly coupled projects. I think like service function chaining and group-based policy in Lithium was a really amazing example where like. They were really actually building a feature here and a feature here, like on a day by day basis, and testing them. And this is going to fail miserably in that case. It's going to, and, and so you're just going to not, you're not going to use it, right? You're going to, you're not not depend on the previous thing. You're just going to give up. You're going to say these two projects are mutually dependent on their version um, snapshots. We're going to have to couple them at the snapshot level. And I would argue that's an example of a failure of. Um, <laughs> Of, of, of reasonable separation of concerns, but it happens. So be it. They're actually dependent on each other. But I think, and I think this. I think if done correctly, this doesn't slow that down. It just doesn't give it any value. But I think this is going to massively speed up development in the case where that isn't true, which is. And, and I, my personal experience from that is just watching the internal development at Brocade. I mean, I think we literally sped up by a factor of three in our development when we stopped developing against Master of Open Daylight. Um, and started developing against the last release because it, it was literally every development effort we went through every single day, at least once a day, was having to ask, "Is it me or is it them?" And like that is just so destructive to your ability to get anything done. And I'm watching that happen also in the OVSD project against um, um, upstream uh, um, uh, OpenStack, where we really should not be doing master master. We should not be doing snapshot coupling with, uh, with OpenStack. We really, really, really need to be testing against a fixed version of OpenStack and a, you know, against a variable version of Open Daylight and a fixed version of Open Daylight against a variable version of OpenStack and not this master master. It just, it, don't, vary, don't change two variables at the same time. It will cause you so much pain and misery. And so that's, I, I think it's, it doesn't help you in a couple of special cases, but it massively helps you in the general case. So I see we have about three three minutes left or so. I mean, does anybody have any sort of questions or thoughts on this? I mean, I know we've again, it's a lot of theory, but <laughs> yeah. Does anybody want to help try and mock it up in a special case other than me? I don't like it. That's it's. No, no, no. It's 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 a valid it's a valid opinion and and. It, it, you know. So, so for, for the record, Ryan with no mic says, I don't like it. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, and also for the record, just so that way, that's a, Ryan, Ryan works at Brocade, and Ryan is one of my favorite humans. So, um, so this is, you know, the, there, are, there are clearly differing opinions. Right. Well, thank you. Happy to chat, chat more with people offline out of the discussion if you want, and they're on mailing lists, and yeah. leave it at that, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a good one.